Welcome to the external. My name is Tafari Green. Welcome to the home of quality education, where we, the external, provide you, the public, yeah, you listeners out there, with fact-based materials sourced from scientific journals, books, educated professionals, scientists, people alike, farmers, and myself. Thank you for listening, and I hope you all enjoy today's topic. The purpose of this podcast is to break down the understanding of the key components of this research and provide a clear understanding of the topic at hand. A lot of people don't understand plants, to include cannabis, (laughs) although many people smoke it and clearly utilize its medicinal usages of the plant. So today, I would like to welcome a guest speaker who will help me break down this research because a lot of people are confused about the fact in which hemp is not marijuana and marijuana is not hemp. Oftentimes, people believe hemp is the male plant of marijuana, which is false. Hemp and marijuana are both cannabis. So To further explain this misconception, I would like to welcome my special guest, Jansen. Did I say that right? (laughs) Yeah, no, that's completely correct. Awesome. Uh, My name is Jansen Gedwed. I'm a horticulturalist at the University of Florida. I work with medicinal plants, hydroponics, and controlled environment plant production. So mostly focused on higher value plant products. Cannabis definitely is that, and it is a very controversial topic it's very misunderstood it's a it's a hot button word for a lot of people i think it was good for you to go ahead and include those opening statements for people's confusion on hemp versus (laughs) cannabis uh, versus marijuana i guess it's definitely good to go ahead and start it off by just saying the legal definition or delineation between hemp and cannabis or marijuana as it's sometimes referred to is simply that hemp is cannabis that has been grown that has less than or equal to 0.3% THC, which is the active or the psychoactive compound that people really associate with getting high or using it for a lot of different medical benefits that come from THC. So whenever we talk about hemp, we're really discussing something that's being focused either on hemp cannabis grown for, for fiber, for alternative products or even for other cannabinoids, which these plants are rich in cannabinoids like CBD. I'm sure you've heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely all the rage in this past few years, but there've also been a lot of, a lot of discoveries and exploration into the other kinds, uh, what they call novel hemp essential oils, which include CBG, uh, CBDA, basically the acidified forms of these with the, the paper that this was going around on is essentially referring to CBDA and CBGA. Yeah, there's been a lot of different research and interest in these kinds of cannabinoids. People just see the dollar signs that come with THC and CBD and all the different kinds of medicinal benefits, and they're immediately very curious on our end. I would definitely think that the easiest way to define hemp versus is cannabis really is that just distinction of percentage of THC allowed, and that is uh, uh, 0.3% by dry weight. Okay. And do you think that it's termed that way because of the legality of the plant? Yeah. Yeah. This is wholly due to legal standards. Even the term marijuana is actually something that's being phased out a little bit. Whenever you talk to people in the industry or, or that are growing cannabis, that's seen as more of a derogatory term. Uh, it's it's actually interesting in like the early 1900s, 1910, 1930s, you had the uh, Mexican Revolution and that brought with it a large amount of Mexican immigrants and fortunately along with that as well a lot of anti-immigration sentiment. A really popular drug of choice for Mexicans at the time was a lot of people in the U.S. didn't really know how to handle this and immediately began to associate cannabis use or marijuana use with deviancy and all these they would say things like <laughs> you're gonna smoke this and it's gonna it's gonna turn you into a bloodlusting murderer psychopath <laughs> which 
Yeah, it's definitely, it's quite radical. And they definitely, you've heard of reefer madness and all these different kinds of propaganda. No, I've never heard of that. No? Oh, my goodness. That's why I brought you here today. There's (laughs) there's been a very large concentrated campaign waged in the early 1930s against cannabis. A lot of lobbying industries in American politics, such as oil, plastic, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, they definitely wanted to begin to associate cannabis with uh, a lot of racial and a lot of, again, anti-immigration stereotypes. And it was even seen uh, hemp, even whenever it was becoming popular in the early 1900s, was seen much more of a direct competitor to cotton. And so a lot Mm. of people say things like, oh, cotton is what the affluent man should wear or the, the, the average American family should wear. And then hemp was always, we didn't have the textile production back then that we do now. So it was a bit more coarse. It could be a bit more rough. It was antimicrobial, antifungal, all these different cool properties yeah. that would, you know, be wonderfully beneficial for anybody. But Dude. just because of that, they would just be like, "Oh, only minorities use use hemp. Only white people use cotton." And you're just like, "Oh my gosh, this is ridiculous!" But yeah, I mean, what I, one thing I must say is when I look for underwear, I look for the antimicrobial. <laughs> because it doesn't right. smell when you're going to the gym. Yeah. So, like, it it's, saves it's me amazing. laundry. <laughs> I've, I've encountered people during conferences before that are huge hemp advocates to the point, you know, there's this uh, 75-year-old man, Robert Clayton here. He's very big in the Florida cannabis advocacy scene. And he would show up to these uh, organic grower meetings and essentially be wearing all hemp clothing. And the entire time he would refer back to him and just say, I haven't washed these in four or five days. You want to come up and smell me? And everyone's just, we trust, we trust that it's antimicrobial. We don't need to smell for ourselves. Yeah. So there's definitely a, there's a lot of different kinds of associations that have been made with cannabis in the past that have really been focused on more of a propaganda aspect and trying to link racial anti-immigration stereotypes to the use of psychoactive cannabis or marijuana. Marijuana in, in this day and age is, again, like I said, slowly being phased out of the lexicon for cannabis terminology just because it's being seen now as essentially just, it's it's not a useful term anymore. It's none of us are sitting around saying marijuana is and associating it with Mexicans. So we're saying marijuana just because that's the term that we've all come to know and whatnot. So yeah, basically moving more away from, from marijuana and saying things like THC cannabis, cannabis or differentiating hemp from cannabis by simply calling it hemp. You would never call or you never call THC cannabis hemp because it directly, you know, counters the actual definition legally of that. But there's actually no taxonomical difference between cannabis marijuana and hemp. They're both cannabis sativa. They both have very similar botanical characteristics. So just looking at at cannabis, a lot of times you can't differentiate in between hemp plants and looking at cannabis plants unless you're looking at something like hemp grown for fiber and that that case you'll see essentially something looks like a piece of bamboo with about 12 12 to 20 leaves on it versus what these large green lush plants that you're used to seeing in in pictures for cannabis and these giant flower buds on there that people know and and dry and smoke wait Uh, so so you're saying that the hemp plant looks more like it looks more like a bamboo plant. Yeah, so so different kinds of hemp definitely have different kinds of morphologies, but the important thing to know is that hemp that's grown for fiber or textile purposes is that they're often targeting growth in and yields from the stem itself oh, and wow. not, not foliage. In a lot of instances when we're looking to try to drive THC production in flower buds, we're looking to have a plant that has a lush foliage. It's able to actually translate all the all the nutrients it's getting into those flower buds to make the, the best medicine. But whenever wow. you're talking about something grown for hemp, for rope, or for textiles, or fiber, you are going to see stuff that's much more stem than it is anything else. And that's you know, by design. So I, I read this a while ago. Farmers have to be careful about if they have, let's say, a farmer that's close to them that has hemp and they're growing marijuana because the hemp plant could affect their marijuana growth. Is that true? Yeah. So... You definitely can have instances where uh, hemp seed 
especially nowadays, is uh, a little bit less regulated in some instances. Since mm. it's now federally legal, you can get your hands on hemp seeds. The, the worst thing that could happen is that you have male plants inside yeah. of your 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 hemp operation that somehow there is pollen. I should clarify to begin with that we want female plants. We want plants that are producing flower buds, which are the reproductive plant parts that we are harvesting and using for cannabis and to smoke. So whenever we have males, we typically only use them for breeding purposes. And unfortunately, whenever you do have males near flowering females, you'll actually have these pollen sacs that are on these male plants that can be essentially pollinating your female plants and you're basically creating a lot of different unwanted characteristics in your plant if you're you know letting it you know cross pollinate with others you're basically introducing some level of genetic variability in the next strain if you're not able to control the actual genetics of that current female plant if it's introduced to another male one so yeah th there's definitely some complications that some people can have with their outdoor cannabis grows specifically yeah. if you're growing medical cannabis outdoors uh and you have a hemp farm that's just down the street or even a, <laughs> a, a ways away you can't have pollen drift does exist and it's it's something that can be of concern to grow Wait, what is pollen drift pollen drift is just know. yeah it's just the uh, the concept that uh, you know pollen obviously everybody has had the run-in with allergies. You can tell that you, you can't really see pollen unless you're seeing it really up close. It's this yellow substance that's created by uh, a lot of flowering plants that are, are used in ways to attract insects to then disseminate their seed. You can say their pollen is a way for plants to spread their, their genetics around and uh, allow it to help crossbreed with other plants. So in pollen drift, we were describing basically movement of pollen from one population of plants to another population of plants. So that's what pollen drift would be. So it's essentially sex in the air. Exactly. <laughs> plants and, will find a way yes. to reproduce. Oh my gosh, they will. <laughs> and there's some plants that, you know, you can have a seed dispersal, you can have pollen dispersal that goes for miles. So like, it's yeah. actually pretty, pretty interesting. Most places here in Florida that grow medical marijuana, it's mostly indoors. Oh in yeah. Houses. It's behind pretty strong filters. It's triple biosecurity. A lot of times these operations have to have levels of biosecurity that would establish protocols for dealing with pollen that's drifting, you know, around basically. Well, and let me tell you all why for the people who don't live in Florida or who's never visited Florida. So most Floridians know. <laughs> around like what i would say springtime your car is if you have a white car it's yellow it's it's just covered in pollen you go outside and everything's this yellowish green color on your car and you just have to constantly wash it because <laughs> if oh. you don't you <laughs> you're just walking around filled in pollen oh yeah it's crazy yeah so we there's some greenhouses that we'll go into and unfortunately you have to take data collection that day and you're right in the thick of that pollen so <laughs> it's a uh, yeah it's, it, it can be a bit intense sometimes and it doesn't matter where you live you, you don't have to live in a rural area or in a suburbanized area you can live in the city and still have pollen covered all over your car mm -hmm. so that's how much pollen spreads throughout florida just yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no it's you never notice you can't look at the air and just see pollen floating around but you just look at any surface that's been in contact with the air around you for longer than, you know, 10 minutes. And you can typically <laughs> see some sort of yellow coat that begins to come under your, onto that surface. Yeah, for sure. So this research is about how hemp compounds such as cabinoids, there's two particular compounds in hemp that blocks the receptor from virus getting into human cells. Next week, I'm going to talk about viruses and how that actually works because viruses need a protein in order to utilize their receptor to get into a human cell. So I'll talk about that next week, but I, I just really wanted to break down the understanding of cannabis and marijuana hemp because when I posted <laughs> the article on Facebook, a lot of people were like, 
I use the word hemp because that's what the article used. Mm -hmm. And some person was like, it's not hemp, it's marijuana. I saw it on the news. Oh, Don't okay. you watch the news? <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I saw it on world news. He said, you should watch more news and learn something. And I was like, oh, okay. I, I guess that's where we're sending our kids to school these days. <laughs> and again, unfortunately, like I said before, the people that latch on to the word marijuana are usually the people that don't know a lot about marijuana, you know? Like, <laughs> so it's, uh, and it's in Texas, that's always, people will say like marijuana, you know, because it's, yeah, definitely, uh, it's, it is all derogatory there. So even someone saying something like that is, is already silly because <laughs> as we've discussed, there is a difference between hemp, which this article touches on and marijuana, which is just high THC cannabis. Yes. So. I was speaking to someone the other day and they were like, that's probably why I never got COVID because I, I smoke weed all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of stoners coming out of the woodworks that say similar <laughs> things. They're just like, I've been, I've been accumulating these compounds in my life for the last 18 years. You know, I must be immune. <laughs> so, then all of a sudden, bam, they got COVID. Yeah, <laughs> that's unfortunately not how it works. And in funny ways, a lot of people that smoke can actually be more predisposed to actually getting these kinds of, you know, viruses yeah. <laughs> just through the the fact that a lot of people do do this activity socially uh a lot of times people will be you know sharing paraphernalia things like that so you wind up having cross contamination of people all the time so it's it's not a guarantee in any way if you smoke cannabis you you will be building <laughs> your immunity to this, this virus <laughs> That's not at all what this paper highlighted. So, yeah. so in a way, that is our disclaimer. Yes, <laughs> yes, please. Please follow current CDC guidelines. I will, I will let you know. I'm not a virologist. Uh, I, am, I am a horticulturalist. I will. I do review their medicinal plant products. So I have a little bit of knowledge in uh, virology and, and epidemiology, but I definitely, I, I will refer to Tafari's information in the next <laughs> podcast here on virology for that part. <laughs> so I want to clarify that I too, am, I'm a plant science major. So I have to learn about basically little of everything because in the plant world, as a plant scientist, you're like the doctor of the field. You have to know what's going on with the plant and be able to give it a diagnosis. So if someone's, hey, this is wrong with my plant, you got to know what you're talking about <laughs> because not all the time it's a biotic situation going on, which a biotic is more like weather, something that affected your plant in some kind of way. And biotic would be something of biologically affecting your plant, a virus, or you have a fungus that took over. <laughs> no, anything like that. Yeah. Uh, so we have to know these things in order to do our job effectively. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so I guess I can also clarify uh, a horticulturalist, because I get this question all the time, a horticulturalist is somebody who works in the art and science of plant production. So I focus primarily on growing plants versus plant science. We, we definitely try to understand uh, a lot more of molecular understanding of plants, try to form an understanding of how to apply actual scientific concepts of plants into things like horticulture or into things like how to grow things, how to process things. Yeah. So uh, Tafari definitely knows a bit more than I do on, uh, <laughs> on, on certain aspects of, of crops and whatnot. I like to think I do. Although I am a, a plant science major, I, <laughs> a lot of people think that I like know everything. And I remember there was a time when I first started school and I thought I knew everything. <laughs> and I too, I didn't know anything about um, cannabis. Mm -hmm. And people would ask me, oh, is it the same plant? And I would say, yeah, because it's a hermaphrodite and yeah. it just changes from male to female. So when it's a male, it's this. <laughs> <laughs> I was this, actually going around telling people the wrong information. Is this podcast <laughs> just you trying to go ahead and, you know, redeem all of those moments where <laughs> Not you at all. spread some false information? <laughs> you're, just, you're just like, we need to come back and clarify now. <laughs> this is so my later. moment. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> set the record right. All right. <laughs> no, but I, I just really enjoy giving out the breakdown of the science in agriculture because there's a lot of misconceptions out there. And what's happening, especially in today's world, it always happened because when you're talking about plants in a way, it, there's a lot of attached to it, the economics and the political aspects of these things. And sometimes all of those things affect our world mm -hmm. when we're all we're trying to do is provide the world's food, shelter, <laughs> just basically oh, yeah. everything. <laughs> yeah, they call cannabis the plant of a thousand uses. And honestly, it's pretty funny whenever you have people at the university levels here in Florida and even across the country, across the planet sometimes, basically having to start from square one when it comes to cannabis research, even in the 2000s. We have all of this research that was done prior to the 1930s, prior to prohibition, and uh, a lot of it was yielding very good information. And if you just think this is the only crop that we've ever essentially just destroyed all prior publications or just invalidated all prior knowledge of just in the in the journey to try to validate political interests, other lobbying corporations. So a lot of people these days just don't know anything about cannabis and are having to start at square one again, having to go to other countries in the world to try to really understand, okay, you were allowed to do this continually through history. We didn't have to stop growing corn for 70 years yeah. <laughs> and then they brought it back with a massive interest in corn there's that funny concept where you just have all of this information that was just lost or the only people writing it down are writing it under the name of dr grows good or you know like so so you, you can't publish in, in a nature publication journal with a, a name like that or dr yeah. kind buds yeah un unfortunately that that's where we were at with that situation but and we've seen it in the past too with apples johnny appleseed era <laughs> yeah. where they made apples illegal because people were turning it into alcohol and <laughs> there was a lot of political and economical aspects to that of why they even did that whole thing and then they saw like oh they someone started the whole apple a day keeps the doctor away then they're like eat more apples <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is, there's almost always some sort of uh, cultural narrative that's associated with the consumption of a crop and it's used to, you know, proliferate consumer interest in that. You know, a lot of, I like to think that these days, if Johnny Appleseed were real, <laughs> he would probably be labeled as a bioterrorist. No, wait, not, not he not, was real. Oh, no, I'm, I oh. should say if he's real today, okay. you know, as, as far as yeah. living amongst us at the moment, you know, if, if you just had some guy running around California just dropping <laughs> weed seeds everywhere and just watching them grow and coming back later <laughs> to try to integrate it into the community, he would be seen as a felon. You know? so that, that is he, true, yeah. He would be labeled with that term, bioterrorist. So while Johnny Appleseed is an incredible historical character for us like i definitely i think it's funny that he's also used as a tool for popularizing in a, a certain crop over other crops and there's no johnny orange guy yeah <laughs> that's, that's true i wish that there was because like the situation with with florida and how that whole thing even started with the citrus canker oh, yeah. and people moving into florida thinking that they can just grow their own trees yep. and then there's an outbreak and then they're like oh you can't cut down my trees and then the orange industry broke down in florida oh yeah like and that's an industry that's valued pretty high it's it's almost a hundred billion dollars it's an enormous industry that's basically like the cornerstone agricultural sector for florida the only other business or industry that's even nearly as large would be the ornamental industry here in Florida, as well as the sugar cane industry here in Florida. And both of those industries, I'd say sugar more than citrus and, and others, have very strong political lobbying arms. A lot of this, too, has to do with the ignorance of society, too. And I don't mean ignorance as like something bad. I'm just saying society is uneducated in a way that like we're, we're seeing it today with the whole vaccination thing. I don't want to get vaccinated because of this or it's my life, blah, blah, blah. It's like the same thing with these, with the citrus canker. People are growing trees. 
they had citrus canker that were affecting nearby farms. And then they're like, oh, this is my tree. I cut it down if I want to. What's gonna, I'm not going to have no government come in here cutting down my tree. <laughs> <laughs> and then next door, there's like a farmer who has to let go of farmers and workers and lose millions of dollars because someone didn't want to cut down their tree. Yeah, And that goes back to how, you know, pollination and that that the whole like how things spread through the air that we can't see it's it's hard because people really just aren't educated on these types of things i can't remember in elementary or middle school where i was taught about viruses or and if i did it was very small it was not a big topic mm -hmm. or like something like earth science where you're primarily talking about uh platonic or is it tectonic tectonic plates <laughs> yeah there's a whole subject on it like that wasn't really a thing at least when i was in school mm -hmm. even in high school i didn't really i don't remember learning about did it have that little thing where it's like all the different kinds of rocks you're just like sedimentary atheist, yeah exactly <laughs> just, yeah you don't really have that same kind of exposure to things like agriculture unfortunately in any school that you'll ever go to and for reasons like agriculture is such a dynamic and complex practice it takes into account physics chemistry geology takes in microbiology just uh, about body. everything yeah, because it's we possible. are like the closest like relative to fungi but still we're still relatively close to plants mm -hmm. so dna wise yeah, but i think it's like we're i think it's 70 percent of our dna is can be found in bananas yeah yeah, so, yeah yeah so. It's a, yeah yeah next time you're looking at a banana or holding one you can just think that this is almost me <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly but. so it's it's the world of agriculture is essential to our to our daily lives this should be something that is taught in school and it's something that's always like been weird to me is that it's never really it's never really in a stem school yeah it's not seen as a profitable thing and unfortunately that's what it is at the end of the day is that a lot of already you have parents that are concerned about their child's well-being in school and to the point nowadays where things are getting ridiculous yeah. uh, but you know, <laughs> book burnings in oklahoma and you know different <laughs> things like that but essentially like you have, you have biology professors in Oklahoma now in different states that are, they can't teach biology all the way just because that includes evolution and, like, yeah. and different things. But for agriculture, it's definitely never been a topic or seen as a topic that is lucrative enough for people to want to include it in their children's upbringing, essentially. If you're, if you are, if your child is learning about agriculture, there's this stigma, social stigma attached to it that, oh, your child's going to be like a dirt farmer, you know, yeah, like, or, yeah. or your child's going to be somebody like you, you picture somebody from the Great Depression wearing overalls and stuff Very like true. that. So yeah. I feel like there's definitely a lot of ignorance that comes from or that comes into American culture and just global culture when it comes when it deals with agriculture and even food products, just because of the fact that there's not a needed investment in understanding agriculture from a young age because as soon as you've gotten through all this kind of indoctrination of what apple a day keeps the doctor away <laughs> all, all these different things there there are some truths to those statements yeah there, there are definitely heck rootin is a compound within apple skins uh, red apples in particular that they found actually lends heavily as an anti-inflammatory so people that have things like rheumatoid arthritis or autoimmune disorders can actually begin to include more rootin in their you know everyday lives to try to have some sort of prevented in this instance just like this cannabis paper an alternative treatment to dealing with symptoms that may be genetic or just uh, ongoing chronic you know, illness symptoms so yeah it's definitely an apple a day can keep some doctors <laughs> away <laughs> it can keep your like it can keep you pain management uh, it can keep pain at bay for some people obviously there's definitely lobbying that large industries like the apple industry like the milk industry yeah. these other ones have that are solely there to commercialize their products and catchy ways or jingles got milk or like you <laughs> yeah. know these things so, 
Yeah. Then you find out they're putting vitamin D in it. Exactly. <laughs> oh my God. Don't even get me started. The dairy industry, like it has come such a far away from days of when they used to actually add things like formaldehyde and like cow brains and different kinds of other things to milk and they would sell it to people. It makes it more creamy and, you know, it's got a better color now and it's, it, it lasts for much longer. And you're like, well, because yeah. you're preserving it. <laughs> like you're embalming our children. You know? like, so yeah, things come along and they wind up a lot of times cleaning up the industry. Policies will come along, clean dairy acts and food safety acts that really help to straighten out a lot of misconceptions yeah. that have been pushed through in or through politics, commercialization of products, things like that. I'm sure cannabis is currently going yeah, it's going towards that, that right yeah. now. The research that's coming out that's saying things like e-cigs or things like cer certain high-level THC products, things like cost. Even in this research document, it talks about the specific cannabinoids that they use to help that it would be like almost like a tablet where people can... Yeah, and the funny thing about... So this paper, I will say, basically, if I can just basically summarize the abstract, it's talking about the use of CBGA which is cannabigerolic acid. See, I can't pronounce the names. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why I was, there, no, no, I was they, trying to stay away from it. No, no, it's totally fine. It's, I, honestly, I remember repeating these words in a dispensary when I first went to Colorado to try to win a free bong. You know? so, <laughs> no, no, there's definitely you know reasons that some people will sit there and learn words, knowledge. Yeah, so in this paper, you wind up having CBGA, which is, CBG is cannabigerol. It's a new compound, uh, well, it's not, new. It's a cannabinoid that's present and has been cannabis since we've known about it. CBG has become a relatively new compound of interest in the industry when it comes to trying to create new novel products. So all cannabinoids have different effects on your medical health. All of them can be metabolized differently. And they're even finding that in ratios, eight to one, uh, eight THC parts to one CBD part, you can actually wind up having what's called synergistic effects or as Sanjay Gupta, the you know, previous Surgeon General of the US has coined the term, the entourage effect. So you have a lot of these cannabinoids that work hand in hand together to do multiple things or alone they can do things. So the future of cannabis is very bright and varied, but in this paper, they're discussing CBGA and CBDA. The difference between CBGA and CBG or CBDA and CBD mm -hmm. is simply the fact that this compound is in its acidified form. So that means that this this compound has not been exposed to heat or combustion or pressure that would have converted it uh, into something like CBD or CBG. And a, a good way to think about that is if you eat just a nug of THC weed, it's not going to get you high because it's currently in its form of THCA. It has not been, it's still acidified. It has not been combusted. Once wow. it has been actually combusted and the smoke is inhaled or that vaporized plant material is inhaled, that's whenever you're actually phytoconverting your compounds from THCA to THC. Mm. And so you're actually getting the effects of that. So the interesting part of this paper, like you said before, a lot of stoners came out of the woodworks claiming I've been. I'm doing glad this you for touched years. on that because yeah, that's why yeah, I. So, I, it's funny because, yeah, you, you basically just have these people saying, I've been doing this for years. I should be immune now. But no, you've essentially been burning and phytoconverting your products into THC and CBG and CBD. And you're actually getting very minimal amounts of uh, the acidified forms of these compounds. And I also read that there's at least 503 compounds in cannabis so if you're, and this is, I'm not sure about this, but I will on the next podcast, <laughs> let you all know how many actual compounds are cannabis. So that's saying that although there's so many of these various compounds in cannabis, the way you consume it doesn't mean you're getting all of those compounds, minerals, and, or what have you. Yeah, at least not in amounts that you might find effective. So in this paper, they're describing using concentrated, highly concentrated amounts of CBGA and CBDA, amounts that you typically wouldn't be able to purchase in a store. So that's a very 
very key point right there. So they're talking about using highly concentrated amounts of these cannabinoids to essentially act as binders, or we call them organic ligands or botanical ligands. It's essentially just some sort of bind or some sort of compound in this case, CBGA or CBDA, that will effectively bind to sites on cells or within human, we talk about human epithelial cells. So cells that are some of the most common cells throughout your body, they're within your lungs, they're within your kidneys, they're on your skin. We talk about those in this research. And that's key because when a virus, especially one that's airborne, the viruses, they stick to your esophagus. Mm -hmm. So they're right there going through their cycle until they're getting into cells and mm -hmm. such and such. And a, a lot of these, one of the methods, and again, you're going to probably touch on this next week as well, but so a lot of ways that coronavirus can affect people, uh, I'm sure people have seen that cartoon depiction of COVID virus now with just a spiky ball. So if you think about those, the tips of those spikes, as being the way in which it can actually infect a human cell, a human epithelial cell, you begin to actually understand how CBG and or how, how these organic ligands uh, or things that have already bound to these sites that these spikes would try to move towards, you can see how they can block them. So that's really what the, the, the purpose of this research is, not to show that in any, you know, kind of enzymatic or any, any sort of other way aside from filling spots that have already it's like filling up a parking lot you know covid can't park in your parking lot and you wind up having it full of cbga and cbd you know there's no more room so it's got to leave or it'll basically just eventually die just yeah. because the virus needs host cells to survive and reproduce so it's going to wind up either finding something to do that or it's just going to to die it's already dead yeah but yeah. It, in it, in order for it to live it needs to attach itself and infect that host cell mm -hmm. So like so it, it wants to dormant. reproduce. Yeah. So yeah, it would just it would it would remain dormant or stay in there until like I got it's you. trying to do something. Yeah. <laughs> so again, I guess for those people out there that think that they can just continue to build this immunity, we're gonna tell you you can go ahead and try to continue to do that, but now you're gonna need to go ahead and get your hands on something like CBGA or CBDA in high amounts, high concentrations of cure to be able to actually begin to have any sort of actual effectiveness on on your coronavirus susceptibility. And on top of this, I need to say this is what's called an alternative treatment, not because you should do it instead. Of, of following CDC guidelines or taking vaccinations or these kinds of things. It's called that because they want to explore it as another kind of way to approach the problem that is coronavirus. There's a lot of places that don't have access to things like vaccines or uh, a lot of here in the U.S. and in Canada <laughs> right now. We have a lot of skepticism about different kinds of vaccinations, uh, but for whatever reason, people are just completely fine with taking horse dewormers and evermectin and pills that are essentially considered alternative treatments that are unexplored for the most part. Uh, yeah. this, this is relatively new research that's coming out. So it, it is still in its infancy, but I will say that it's very promising. It goes to show you that cannabis has a lot of potential outside of the realm of just being used for stoners. It actually does have medical benefits that reach into the realm of antiviral. And there's been some, the, the paper that we're discussing now is only talking about how these cannabinoids can block the, the receptors that COVID would need to infect somebody. Whereas some of these other papers that are coming out now are actually saying CBD cannabidiol has actual antiviral effects. And so yeah. it's actually inhibiting uh, a virus based on some sort of antiviral effect versus a physical blocking effect. So there are a multitude of ways that cannabinoids are being explored as alternative COVID treatment. This you, you have to definitely understand a bit of it or be able to dissect a paper to, to see how useful it's going to be. Cause yeah, and not only that, it's important to um, know for the people out there, even if you want to break down the cannabis to get to these compounds, you have to have a whole laboratory setup because you have to sterilize these things because there are pathogens on cannabis. So you have to sterilize it, 
break it down, make sure that whatever you're breaking down isn't filled with like viruses and bacteria and so on. <laughs> so, and then this, this then is, I think they break down like down to the oil and then they take, they abstract the, uh, the the compounds that's needed so it's all process and uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to even yeah. Yeah, the, the, amount, the amount of lab materials that you would need at home to be able to actually synthesize or concentrate and stabilize cbga and cbda in amounts that you would you know need to actually effectively build some defense mechanism for covid is ridiculous even in this paper they stated that the amounts required to limit by 50% infection. They, they've said that those were essentially, you know, 20 times as much as what a human could actually get from the maximum allowable amounts of CBGA that comes in a product. Wow. So you, and that for whatever reason, they just said, we gave it to a beagle too. And, <laughs> and uh, we gave it even higher amounts because there's no restrictions on beagles and cannabis. <laughs> and uh, essentially they were able to get a little bit more suppression of COVID, but they still even doubling the amounts uh, with the dog, they weren't able to get nearly enough suppression to even reach the 50% mark. Wow. So these are things that need to be expressed in these papers that are more than likely going to be hidden a little bit because these words, cannabis and COVID together in a publication, hot button. It's any, anybody will let that enter into your journal if it has good reviews on it. And if it's tackling these problems right now, these are real hot button issues. The, the only thing that I dislike about when research documents are hidden or it's you have to pay high dollar to to get them is that you have people that are nutritionists, for an example, mm -hmm. that like dislike, I don't know, GMOs. And then they see a research document. <laughs> they know it's not widely known mm -hmm. about this specific research so they put out this false narrative or false information about things then it gets spread like wildfire and then people are out there starting conspiracy theories yeah. and then it just starts to roll down the hill and then as scientists and people in the ag field we're like, oh my god now we can't do this and this research because there's a stigma against it. And all you're trying to really do is help society and plants within itself, because there's a lot of like wild types of plants that are like dying and we, that we can't recover. And we need to utilize some aspects of breeding in order to keep these things <laughs> going. Yeah, we definitely have to allow scientists to be the people that are really interpreting these papers and this information, because unfortunately this material is dry. It's very boring for, for people that don't understand or don't care about things like horticulture, you know, plant science or pharmacology, pharmacognosy, any things like that. Somebody's going to care much more about Ted's blog post or on what he felt about this cannabis and thing than actually somebody sitting down and reading the paper because his emotions are going to be much more, you know, enthralling than his opinions are going to be much more enthralling and simple than the actual complex things that are mentioned in this paper. Yeah, and this is why I started the podcast is to dispel all of these negative topics within agriculture. And I just wanted to clarify a lot of things because scientists are hurting in the ag field and people without realizing it is that they're they're hurting the economy because of their ignorance towards certain things. But yeah, I, I just want to wrap up this podcast and I'm going to hit you guys back up next week with another episode continuing this conversation so that we can hit a lot of topics within this research document, clarify a bunch of things, give you the understanding of how it works. I, I just want to go ahead and say thank you so much, Fari, for having me on and allowing me to share some of the information that's been you know published out there and trying to dispel any kinds of misconceptions that people may have about these kinds of articles being released and publicized. But I, I will say, too, if anybody wants more information on these topics, I highly recommend that you look out for extension papers or essentially papers that have been released by universities 
they take actual scientific papers like we do and they break them down into understandable articles that anybody can really read. So things like this Oregon State hemp and cannabis <laughs> <laughs> papers like this are actually best left to be broken down by universities and scientists. I mean, and as I didn't, as I noticed, as I even posted it on Facebook and Facebook took it down because it had the word COVID in it. Although it, it's a scientific <laughs> article, but hey, we're not going to talk about that right now. <laughs> what I've noticed is that I had at least 60 comments and not one person read the article. <laughs> not uh, one person comment, read the article. Right? <laughs> they saw the, the title, the headline, read the abstract, but no one actually read the article. At least read the discussions. The discussion and the conclusion of any paper are going to have much more information in there that actually lends to your understanding of a scientific paper versus the abstract. Because the abstract is simply either justifying or not justifying their hypothesis or whatever their experiment was initially intended to do. But you know, yeah. a lot of times like the, the abstract and research documents to me personally are sometimes more confusing because they're not <laughs> a lot of information <laughs> because all scientists, in one yeah. <laughs> and, and I think scientists forget that they're trying to, they're talking about whatever it is that they're researching, but they're putting too much of the science in there and not actually breaking it down to the understanding of a everyday person. Oh, definitely. You know, yeah. So that's papers are meant to be shared at symposiums and conferences and journals that are very technical, but yeah, there's a lot of science and communication that's just lost uh, yeah. whenever they try to disseminate this information to the population here. To that guy that watched the news and learned something, the reason why I don't do that and I rather listen to scientists or read scholarly journals or educational books is because the thing with journalists is that they get their information from third parties and most times they're not educated on these topics and they just break down what they think they've learned out of these third party documents and they're disseminating it out to the public and oftentimes use very bad terminology mm -hmm. and have a lack of understanding of how to actually talk about the topic. Yeah. No, there's to this day, you have people trying to uh, smoke cannabis leaves. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you, there's, there's definitely a lot of clarification that gets missed out on. Yeah. Um, and uh, until we have plant scientist investigative journalism. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't think there's going to be a lot of uh, truths told out there or the whole truth told about uh, certain plant products. Yeah. So. And with that, this is the external. Please remember to like, follow, subscribe, comment, review, help me out people. <laughs> I know this one went a little bit longer than I typically do, but I hope you guys truly receive the understanding and the breakdown of what we're talking about. Yeah. Thank you all for listening and good night.